Welcome to this audio session recording taken at the Agroforestry Show, which was organised in September 2023 as a partnership between the Woodland Trust and the Soil Association. For more session recordings, go to agroforestryshow.com or explore and subscribe to the Agroforestry Show YouTube channel. Enjoy! Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jess Ralph, um, uh, Caroline uh, with me, and Kat our biologist, ecologist, and we have the business um, evolving forests and we, ha we have no way to describe what we do really. A lot of what we do is sort of media creation and filmmaking, but a lot of what we do is localised supply chains. And so we work in this sort of grey area where people want to use timber more locally. You know, a very extreme examples from their own farm woodlands in their own construction projects. Some of that is also can be for very big, multi-billion pound developments in London um, and everything in between that. And that's given us over the last probably 10 years quite a big insight into how you can use non-traditional timbers within the timber markets. And so for the next hour, we're not really concerned with how to grow great Sitka spruce. Aren't particularly interested. Um, and we're not concerned with big forestry per se. What we're concerned about is whether it's actually possible to derive timber from agroforestry systems and small woodlands. And if anyone wants to go out and get an ice cream now, we think it's very possible. And we have some case studies we'll show you about that. But we'd also like to hear from your experience as well. And I know there's quite a lot of cynicism about this, but hopefully what we can do is demonstrate some of the techniques that we've seen that make that possible. So what we're going to do is we're going to look a little bit at what we're trying to achieve when we're talking about growing timber and growing for timber. And we're going to look at what qualities that includes. So when we talk about quality and we talk about timber, what does that actually mean in terms of the actual bits and pieces of the timber? And then we're going to talk a bit about um, how that might happen. A little bit about regulations and about tree health and about timber movements and a little bit about what the dynamics of that supply chain are. And then we're going to look at some of the pitfalls, some of the silvicultural techniques that are needed to produce this kind of timber. So the first thing to say is that if you're expecting to grow timber from agroforestry, agroforestry for volume markets, kind of forget it. You know, th these are the big Sitka spruce markets, the kind of material the big mills are going to take. You're not really going to get that from small scale systems and it's to our mind, a bit crazy to try and aim at that. If you want to produce pallet wood, go ahead and produce pallet wood, but you're probably not going to do it from individual trees and from small scale systems. What we're looking at are more niche products than that. And so um, we're looking at niche markets, but whilst I said we're not looking at volume markets, Niche markets are potentially quite big as well and often bigger than we think. And to put it into context, as a sort of random example, if you were to make a chopping board 30 by 20 centimetres by 2.5 centimetres thick for every household in the UK, that's about 62,000 cubic metres of timber that you need to do that. These aren't small markets. If you think about if you were to house if you were to floor your house in oak or sweet chestnut and every house in the village or every house in the development, suddenly these things that the big producers call niche markets actually aren't quite so niche anymore. And they're far more adaptable to different qualities of timber. You don't necessarily need to be running the same quality timber through very large mills. And so things like flooring and cladding often need less processing than other types of timber. Things like furniture are interesting because you don't necessarily need huge straight logs 
of very good quality. You know, chur leg, you only need that much straight timber. And if you can get that much straight timber out of a log, and it's a good log, then why not use that? And this is the sort of area we work in and the sort of area we find increasingly we can make work financially. And then finally in this slide is there's the whole local, the whole niche market thing and there's the whole local market thing. And we probably work in a very specific place where people ask us about localness. But it does seem to be something that's graining ground, even over certification and sustainability. People want to know that their products are locally derived. Not in every circumstances, you know, a 2,000 house development probably doesn't care that much. But a 12 house rural development, they actually might care. And then at the other end of the scale, we've worked with Lendlease, which we'll look at later on a four billion pound development, and they care as well. They want to use as much local material locally as possible. And so even if the timber you have isn't of superb quality or going to produce volume, localness and, localness and niche markets can, can help provide a market for that. But I think there's some things to think about right at the start. And there's, um, these are things that people often don't really get their head round, and it can be quite, quite infuriating sometimes. A standing tree is useless, unless today and you want shade. But for timber, it's like, the, the equivalent I always give is it's like the oil industry. No one wants oil that's in the ground. It's not of any use, you can't fill your car with that. Neither can you fill it when it's pumped out of the ground and put in a barrel. You can only use it in your car once it's been refined. And timber is exactly the same way. There's a reason standing timber is such low value, is because it's a useless thing. It's only of use when it's a finished product. And so to think you can make money just out of standing timber on a very small scale is very difficult. There has to be some kind of processing chain that allows that raw timber to become something of use to someone because people will only buy something of use. Um, and then along that processing chain, you've got a whole load of steps that can happen. And the other big thing people often mistake is that they think they can take their timber, they can saw it, and then there'll be an automatic mark for oh, I've got great oak here. I've sawn it up into planks. Why does no one want to buy it? Well, because putting an unseasoned plank in your house just means it warps and cracks. You know, for a lot of these markets, people want seasoned timber. People want timber that's not just the right quality in the timber itself, but has been processed in the right way. So the further you can vertically integrate, the further down the chain you can get, not necessarily on your farm or your holding, but locally within a small scale supply chain of small scale sawmillers and kilners, the better it is. Um, and then of course, there's the whole issue of volume. And this is something we've <laughs> quite naively learned the hard way, of course, is that you, tell it, you go and do an assessment and you tell a client there's 30 cubic meters of standing oak that they've got in their hedgerows. Oh yeah, fantastic. You do quite a lot with 30 cubic meters of timber. But of course, that, it, that is not the amount of timber they've got. Once you've squared it off and you've sawn it up and you've taken all the sapwood off, what you've got is probably, and you've planed it down, what you've got is probably 50% of that. And the further down the processing chain you go, obviously, the smaller the amount of timber you get. But conversely, that value goes up exponentially as well. So between a standing tree and it being a sawn plank, you might lose 30% of your timber, but you've actually probably increased the value of the timber four or five fold. And this isn't so dissimilar from other agricultural products as well, especially um, in livestock where, you know, having a cow walking around is not that much use to anyone. It's the more it gets processed, the more valuable it's going to be. And timber's in exactly the same way. And if you can think of timber as just another agricultural product on your land, then the business and economic dynamics 
work exactly the same way. So what makes good timber? I've used the word quality an awful lot, and people have their own idea of what quality is. If you're in the biomass industry, it's something that grows very fast, and you can get down, and you can chip as quickly as possible, and that's pretty much the be-all and end-all of it. If what we're talking about is, can you produce cladding or floorboards or furniture or chopping boards or whatever it is, then there's a whole other aspect of quality that's needed. And it's worth being aware of this right from the outset, whether you are starting to grow quality timber, if that's the aim, or whether you're just looking at whether you can use hedgerow trees or trees that are already existing on the farm unit, then knowing what you're looking at in a tree is important. And the, fir the first thing is knottiness. Um, and knottiness is reflected in branchiness. The, the more branchy something is, the knottier something is. And the knottier something is, the less quality it is. Um, flooring that's full of knots, especially dead knots, people don't like. Same with cladding, it can cause all sorts of issues. If you're going to use it structurally, say in glue lamination, then all those knots will be cut out and then all the timber will be glued back together. And the more cutting out you have to do, the more expensive it is to do it and the less someone's going to pay for that timber. And we'll move on to this knottiness thing in a bit. We'll talk about pruning a little bit as well. And it's worth being aware that many people misunderstand this very geeky little important thing that all knots go through to the very centre of the tree. They don't just start appearing at one place. If there's a knot there, it goes all the way through. And it, you don't need to have completely clean timber, although that's very nice. But once it gets too knotty, it becomes really problematic. And if you can judge whether something's going to have a value or not based on its branchiness, then you're in a much better position to assess that timber. And we'll look at an example of that later. Second thing is grain angle. And um, again, this is something a lot of the time you can only see when you start breaking into the tree, but it's critically important to know about the grain angle of the wood. And most of you, any of you that have open grown trees will probably be able to see the twist of a tree in the bark of the tree. And that twist relates to what we call grain angle. And this is, you know, this here is, quite an extreme implication of a problem of grain angle you know, with a baseball breaking because the grain has gone right the way through it. But that could happen on a structural beam. It could happen on a piece of flooring. It could happen in any product. And if you, if you know that there's a tree with an extreme twist in it, like this one, then it might be worth just saying, you can just put that aside. Let's just forget about that. We're not really going to get much timber out of that. Let's just concentrate on other stuff as well. Um, the next thing is I've clubbed together speed of growth, height and diameter. Um, I know there's some foresters in this room and some very good foresters. Uh, there's a lot of people that have been involved in volume forestry where the, the yield class, how fast it grows, is the be-all and end-all. If, yeah, if you don't understand yield class, you're in a very lucky place. Don't even bother. <laughs> All right? How fast it grows for what we're talking about doesn't really matter. Knottiness matters and grain angle matters and density and all sorts of other things matter. Speed of growth just doesn't. Diameter's probably more important. And sometimes you can grow timber so fast that it causes huge problems um, when you start to saw it. And I think um, this is, I've got some samples you can look at later. This is a piece of Western red cedar that's been grown very fast and has uh, what we call early wood cell collapse. So the cell walls are so big, when it's gone into the kiln, all the cell walls have collapsed and produced this corrugated effect in the timber. And actually, for us, what's more important is what the volume of timber looks like, no matter how old it is, what the diameter is. 
if it's too small a diameter for it to go to the local mill, if it's too big a diameter for them to use, and what's its height like. And these are all really questions you need to start having an interaction with your local sawmiller about. So we are lucky we have a range of sawmillers we use, um, and if we moan at them enough, they'll saw timber down to 15 centimetres um, and timber up to a couple of metres diameter. I mean, they're quite extreme ranges, but there's different ways of sawing, different ways of doing it. You can bring the saw to the timber, you can take the timber to the saw, but you need to know from your local sawmiller or whoever you think is going to saw this timber, what they'll actually take. And the same is true of length as well. You know, your perfect timber tree is beautifully straight up to 20 meters with very little taper and no knots and that doesn't actually really exist certainly not on most farms we visit but you know actually um this is um this came from a site in london and the red line that we've marked on it which is the top of the saw log when it goes to the sawmill I think that's about 1.2, 1.3 metres, something like that. And that's fine, they'll deal with that. Um, it takes some persuading at first to deal with this random timber. But actually what we've found, once the sawmillers are used to doing with it, they are not used to using it, they're quite happy to use it because they're often quite quick to saw this kind of thing. And what comes out of it, as we'll see later, is often incredibly beautiful timber. So I wouldn't be too worried about height and diameter, and I certainly wouldn't be concerned with getting timber to grow fast at all. And then finally, having talked about quality, the, there's a, a quality in poor form as well that can be of absolutely exceptional value. You know, what, what we're generally looking for is nice straight timber, and nice not free, grain angle, blah, 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 blah. But actually, some of the poorest timber is the most valuable. And um, here's some examples. Um, I think this actually came out of the same log, but we got some bur oak in here, which is highly prized by furniture makers and wood turners. And they're like the big growths on the side of the trees that make it look like it's not going to be a usable piece of timber at all. And uh, on the bottom is a piece of, uh, actually, I think it's ripple sycamore possibly from Cardiff um, and this if you look at the bark of the trees the bark looks rippled and it looks like there's a problem with the grain angle it's very easy not to use it or not to consider it and some of these trees have huge landscape value and huge ecological value and I think probably ought to have said at the beginning what we're not advocating and what we're not concerned about is just taking trees down for timber but if you have a bur oak that's fallen anyway, and it needs to be moved, then why not make best use of it? And I think the point of this slide is to, to, to be open-minded. If the timber's solid on the inside and it looks like it's a sawable volume, it's worth keeping it to saw it. So having sort of looked at quality very quickly, let's look a little bit about um, timber species as well and in what we're trying to achieve here and and actually I sort of hummed and hard about whether to put this section in or not because in some ways it doesn't matter you know, hardwood and softwoods differ in how they're formed how they work um, biologically and that relates to the timber but the fact is is that probably what you're putting in the ground is going in for more primary reasons than growing timber. And if that's the case, what the species are, don't worry about it too much from the growing point of view. Similarly, if what you're looking at are pre-existing hedgerow trees or small woodlands, the timber that's there is what's there. If you're starting to grow timber and you think you are growing for a quality crop, let's say you wanna put your money into growing amazing value sweet chestnut in sub quarter hectare plots like they do in France, then this kind of thing is worth knowing about. And there's a lot of information out there on timber quality, but it is important to understand the biological differences. 
it's also important to understand um, how these trees, what how these trees are optimized and how they optimize themselves, because it gives you a clue as to how you can use them. So some trees, um, sweet chestnut in particular, partially oak, Douglas fir, larch, western red cedar, a very durable species. They've optimized their biology to be full of oleoresins, volatile oils that allow them a natural durability and protection. Some trees just have missed out that stage and said, we don't need to be durable. We scatter ourselves so widely that losing half of our seedlings doesn't matter. And they're, they're not, they don't have so many oils and resins. And as a result, they produce not very durable timber. And that ends up, sycamore is a good example. Um, most of the pioneer species aren't particularly durable. But it makes a difference in how you then use that timber. So a durable species you might use in outdoor cladding, a non-durable might go in indoor flooring or furniture or whatever it is. But knowing how hardwoods especially, because they're much more variable or optimised themselves, gives you a clue as to the eventual use of that. Um, fruit and orchard trees, um, I think I've put in just to make the point that don't ignore them as potential timber species, even though what you're getting out of them might be primarily a fruit or nut crop. At the end of their life, there's no reason why this sweet chestnut couldn't go on to produce a small amount of timber. I mean, this one's fairly extreme. We're probably not going to get much out of that. But I, but I can certainly see at that second stage above the first big branch the potential of getting some timber out. And if you were taking 30 or 40 of these trees down in an old redundant order, orchard, that soon starts to add up to a fair amount of actual sawable timber. And then, although they're very heavily branched, let's not ignore how we used to use timber. And this bottom picture, this is from um, a 19th century work on naval architecture, on shipbuilding. And this, this book, which is all about how to design and build ships, about the first third of it is on how to grow the timber for these ships. And what it, this is showing is this is matching up different type, different parts of the ship or the ship to be built with different ways timber might branch. So you go and look at a tree and rather than saying, as two branch to do anything with. Actually, what you do is you take a template and go, oh yeah, okay, that's going to be the stern post of the ship. We can sell that to the Navy. And whilst we don't do this anymore, there's no reason why we shouldn't, especially in furniture making, which often includes quite extreme pens. Um, and then there's the sort of club together the new hardwood species. There's things that are being grown in agroforestry systems, and I am especially thinking about older in uh, forest gardens or eucalyptus species, all these species that we don't know much about that have a huge potential for timber. And it's something we're investigating with the Woodland Trust at the moment by taking some of these species. We're taking older West West and beach. Um, and investigating how they can be used in building regulation compliant window frames, floors, structural <coughs> beams, this kind of thing. And they, they, they potentially have great potential. It's just that we don't know that much about them. And as the years go on, we'll start to know more and more about them. And then there's the extremely, I've called them novel species, but um, sort of looking beyond timber you know, in what, if we think about what we're talking about as high-value products, then, you know, eucalyptus, for instance, perhaps doesn't have potential for timber, but perhaps it does have potential in biodistillation. And so we're experimenting with Sheffield University at the moment, and we're looking at how we can extract eucalyptus essential oil from UK-grown eucalyptus. Because the fact is that sort of kilo for kilo this bracing silver birch body wash is probably way more valuable per kilo 
than a kilo of silver birch sawn timber. And the, whilst this, these are quite novel uses and they're not yet developed, I think they are around the corner. And they're worth just keeping an eye on what's going on in case suddenly that tree that you thought was of low value potentially becomes much higher value. Um, I'm just going to look at a couple of quick case studies that bring that together. Uh, the first one is, um, we're going to concentrate on the first two, not in agroforestry systems at all, but in urban forestry. I don't really see much of a difference. They're open grown trees. Um, from my perspective, whether something is a high forest or an agroforestry system or an urban forestry system kind of doesn't matter so much these days. We need to open our minds to what we think forestry is. And so looking at open grown trees and urban systems and street trees, I don't think is much different from looking at agroforestry systems. And this is Elephant Park. So this is in zone one. Um, there were about 20 or 30 trees coming down of which this was probably the best quality one. And you can see on it here, it's marked up for felling. We haven't yet marked it up for soaring. But these came down, they were moved out, they moved to the local mill. What's interesting is, is there's, with these big developments, there's about a five year lag between taking the timber down and the buildings they're going to go in, because obviously the buildings have to be built. But Lendlease, who were the client for this, were very insistent that this timber be used on the same site. And so the timber's sawn. We run a furniture making competition um, and all the lobby areas for the new buildings at Elephant Park are now using the timber that came off this site. And there's some examples here. The table and chairs at the top all came off the site. On the bottom picture, all of the uh, bookshelves and the cladding above the bookshelves, internal cladding, that is all timber that came from these pretty poor open grown trees. And this tree is no different from what you'll find in a hedgerow or a field or in so many other places in rural areas. Um, and then following that is another lend lease project. This is in Silvertown. So this is, um, if you know Excel Stadium in London, there's a huge piece of barren land opposite it. And this is off, um, these are trees coming off that site. And again, you can see the trees are no different from anything you'd find in potential agroforestry systems or rural small woodlands. Um, and this is just to demonstrate how we start to go about the process of making timber from them. So it's, it's not like a forestry system where you might generically look at a whole stand. We look on a tree by tree basis. And so here we've marked up two phases of timber quality, the red box is the primary quality material, the green boxes are, it should go to the sawmill, the sawmill might laugh at us and throw it away, but let's send it there anyway. Um, and everything's graded like that, and the harvesting contractors get these pictures, and we mark on where we can, where the lines are for these, and then they cut to our specification, stack it a gift to green, red, and then it goes off to the sawmill like that. And um, this, this is the end result of Silvertown to give you some idea of the type of quantities we're getting. So this is our 40, 44 trees of which this was the best of the lot. Um, we're getting 500 board meters of material out of that. So that is um, probably enough to do, they'll probably get four or five flats worth of flooring, for instance, out of this, but actually it'll be used a lot more than that. There's the, the apple here. So this, this is a good example. The apple is um, 1.7 meter length, same height as me, 15 mil thickness, sadly not the same thickness as me. Um, uh, that, that's what it was sawn to. The average width, uh, 145mm, sawn to 15mm thickness, 10 boards out of that. And we'll optimise, because we don't know how we're going to use the timber, 
we generally saw to a couple of standard specifications, 15, 27, 54 mil. And from that, most producers of cladding or flooring or furniture can work within those boundaries of those thicknesses. And, and if you're going to store up the timber because you don't have a good market for it right now or you're not quite sure what the market's going to be, then producing some very standard specifications like this is important because if you just make up what you think someone's going to need, you're in inevitably going to get it wrong. And so within these, it's worth bearing in mind that the 15, 27, 54 assumes that there's going to be three or four mil of planing that goes on minimum once someone gets these boards. So you have to include that in it. Um, this, bring, this example brings us on to sort of subject of knottiness, I guess, and what is too knotty. This is a, what's it? Three hectare woodland, max, possibly a bit less than that. Um, in mid Devon, farm woodland was planted up. I think it did have a first thinning, but probably not much after that. Incre when I first went into it, I thought the timber was so knotty, we were never going to be able to do this. And the client wanted to build this house out of this timber. And I thought, this is just laughable. This is, this is not going to happen. And no one wants to do a job for a client and turn around and say, this is just not going to happen anyway. We did some volume calculations, um, sent the images off to the sawmill and to Buckland Timber, the glue land manufacturers that were going to make this, and they just kind of shrugged their shoulders and said, yeah, we can work with that. Um, and so this is now what is about to happen. So from timber that you think might be too knotty and too poor value, the potential is actually to do some extremely beautiful construction and design from it. Just because the number of woodlands we go to where people say to us, could you come and have a look? It's the worst wood in the world, but can you just come and have a look? And you go. And other than one I went to the other day that really was the worst wood in the world, <laughs> generally there is a fair amount of good timber. And in, in the case of this woodland, the fact that it had been so badly thinned or you know, there had not been enough thinning meant that actually the whole thing's going to be clear felled because it's inevitably going to fall down anyway um, if there's too big a gap opened up, which gives us enough timber to provide the structural and exterior cladding components for this building. Um, and then I don't know whether there's any public sector people in here. This is a piece of work we did with Cardiff City Council that just came to us today. We take oh, a load of timber a year. Um, they weren't quite sure how much, but I know London extract 30,000 cubic meters of timber a year. You know, they are big producers of timber. And it generally gets chipped to landfill um, or to biomass. And what can they do with this? And this was a case of looking at the parks, their arboreta and uh, the woodlands, looking at the quality of what they had and working with them to see if they had a supply chain that could be developed. And like all local authorities, they had a lot of timber, they had a lot of trees that were taken down. They have quite a lot of space in um, yards around the city centre that could be used for storage and processing. And they also have quite a lot of infrastructure that perhaps isn't traditional forestry stuff, like this uh, tractor and trailer lash-up that uh, someone had built at some point. Uh, but they can carry big logs on this. And when we started looking at the logs, it was super interesting. The, um, there was no big volumes of anything, but there were small volumes of really quite exceptional material. And this is two examples of uh, Ripple, Ripple Beach, I think, and uh, spalted material. And although these are only single logs, the value is more than, say, 30 or 40 standard spruce trees out of a forest. And all they need to... They had a sawmill sitting in a container that they'd never used. They have everything in place there to do it. They just didn't realise the value of what they thought was a waste product. 
And so I hope that gives some sort of insight into um, what the possibilities are. I'm going to hand over to Caroline for a few minutes now so I can have a drink. And then we'll come back and look at how you might get from this sort of standing timber to a finished product. OK, hello. I know some of you, I don't know many of you, um, following on from Jez, who is always inspirational and far more interesting than this bit of the session is going to be, which is why I'm going to almost not rush through it, but I'm not going to dwell too much because I, we really want to open it up to you guys to ask questions and just discuss what we've, we've said. But really, it, it's, it's compliance bits and pieces. They're really boring stuff. If you're going to be planning or you have forestry, ag agroforestry systems, you want to, within that system, think about your future timber trees. Do what, what compliance, what regulations do you need to consider? Because, unfortunately, there are. There always will be. And rightly so. So, you know, agroforestry systems are the classed woodland. Um, James is sat in the middle, about there, who um, he's sort of a bit of an expert on agroforestry for the for the Forestry Commission. But um, yeah, the definition, of, I think, in a national forestry inventory, what is the definition of, of woodland, James? Greater than half a hectare in That's size, right. wider than twenty meters in width. Uh, trees capable of reaching five meters in height or above, and those trees having a cover, a canopy cover of twenty percent or over. Well done, thank you very much. <laughs> um, so you know, I think when you're planning, you have to work out: is your is your agriculture system going to become a woodland? What's that going to be? Would you perhaps need to look at have a woodland management plan? So woodland management plan is something you can get grant aided for, certainly in England. Forestry Commission um, have the templates, and you, it, it's a way of you planning what your future prescriptions for your woodland, your system, are going to be. And it's a very useful thing to have, not just because you can get a grant for it, but also because it opens up different markets as well. So the biomass market, you need to have a woodland management plan to access certain biomass markets, and also so for certain certification as well which we'll come on to um, and then of course there's a UK forestry standard as well I don't know how many few other lectures you've been to today about or whether any of them covered compliance and uh, standards etc as in agriculture we also have standards within forestry and it is a gold plated standard the UK forestry standard UK wide and it basically sets out within the nine guidelines that go with it or ten um, what the best practice for forestry is and that is recognized UK and internationally, actually, through the certification bodies. Um, felling licences. If you're going to grow trees and you want to make stuff out of said trees, you are going to have to cut down a tree. And to do that beyond a certain volume, so five cubic metres per calendar quarter, you are going to need a felling licence. Otherwise, somebody might come along and fine you. So um, it's just all of this is worth considering that... If you want to grow timber, you, you are going to have to comply with certain things. Always ask your local Forestry Commission advisor for advice, because that's what the Forestry Commission are there for. They are there, and NRW in Wales, and Forestry in Scotland in Scotland, to advise you on the best use for your, for your um, forestry in Woodland. So, diseased timber. Um, again, perhaps something that you haven't been talked at or, or, or talked about today. But um, it is a real thing, the same as you have animal health um, and a really, really good sort of animal health regulations in, in the agricultural industry. We also have, have plant health and plant health inspectorates. And we are, I suggest, particularly within forestry, probably pretty much ahead of the game as far as plant health risk assessments and pest risk assessments are concerned. Um, we, there are increasing numbers of tree health, tree related pests, so whether that be pathogen, spore based, insect, or even the grey squirrel and deer, which are equally pests within a forestry system, um, which, which needs addressing. But I'll just skip through this, but basically be aware, be aware there is a really good system through what's called Tree Alert. If you see something within your trees that you think, oh, that's not right, or it's looking a little bit sick, go to Tree Alert or have a look at what's called the Plant Health Risk Register. It's a UK risk register, and it will tell you everything that's here now and what is expected, because there are some real nasties that are in Europe now that, um, that could have a major effect on, on our tree species. Um, and again, Forestry Commission Tree Health pages, absolute wealth of information to go and have a look at. 
Certification. Hmm. Do I discuss certification? Where's Andy Grundy? He's sat somewhere at the back. <laughs> um, what is certification? I mean, Jez mentioned earlier. I don't think I'm going to dwell on this by any means. It's, I think it's more about localness, really. Does the market demand a certified product? Some markets do, other markets don't. We have what's called FSC, Forest Stewardship Council, PEFC, Pan European, something other. But we also have what's called Grown in Britain as well. Grown in Britain is a provenance standard, a bit like your red tractor within the agricultural industry, but it says that this tree, this product, has been grown in Britain or come from a tree that's grown in Britain. Um, so, yeah, by British. It's, it's, the same, it's the same concept as you have in farming, really. Um, and I think all the research that you read, I mean, the Landworth Alliance did a really good paper, actually, on what do you need to do before you start planting? If you were going to plant a field of, I don't know, carrots or potatoes or whatever, you, know, you need to look at what soils you've got. You need to look at whether, the, whether what you want to plant is going to grow there and what you need to do to make sure that that crop establishes and it continues to grow and it continues to thrive and yield, etc., etc. So consider the species against what objectives you have. You know, look at the markets, look at future markets. Markets within forestry don't change that much, to be fair. You know, um, look at good quality genetic planting stock. Consider your biosecurity, if I've said before, where you're going to source your trees from. You probably heard this today again about you know, plant healthy, which is a, a now a standard where all trees bought from nurseries that need, are going to go into publicly funded grant um, schemes have got to be plant healthy. So that is a biosecurity standard which, you will, which nurseries are audited against to make sure that we have got healthy planting stock. And this, was, this is quite an interesting one. Whoever, so is whoever, so the original objectives, your granddad or your dad or whomever who planted the trees in the first place, they had timber in mind. You might not have timber in mind, but it's just worth going back to those original plans and just seeing what their objectives were. Um, and the last one, is there access? So many woodlands planted, with or without grant, absolutely no access whatsoever to get to it. Expensive job to put in later, but always consider how you're going to get into that crop so you, you can get timber out of it. Pretty simple to consider. What do you need to do if you're going to manage for timber? So management of small woodland, individual trees uh, require different management approaches. Chairs has gone over much of this, actually. Um, so growing timber, it's either silver cultural decision or an incidental benefit. Knowing which you are aiming for will increase, create management efficiencies. Always look for what's going to eat them. Squirrel, deer, rabbits, voles, insects, all of these um, will eventually, without exception, impact on the quality of your timber, without exception, particularly gray squirrels. Um, and it, these are just, this is just like, it's not rocking science, but it isn't as simple as just stuffing a tree in the ground, <laughs> which is what we're saying, really. Look at good establishment. You know, I see you've got several nurseries out here. You've got the tube guys here. You've got, you know, go and speak to them, which you probably have already. They're the experts in what and how you can establish good quality trees. Actually, I'm going to bring you back for pruning, mister. Because <laughs> this is your thing. Pruning is everything. <laughs> the end. <laughs> OK. <laughs> you can do it good, you do it bad, you do it indifferently. But if you don't do it, you get naughty trees. And no one likes naughty trees. And that's, that's almost <laughs> the end of it. You cannot, do, well, you can do too much. You can kill the tree. But... It, um, for, for, for a lot of people, a lot of agroforestry systems especially, pruning will be a natural part of your tree care because in quite a lot of systems, just the act of needing to be able to get a vehicle or a person under the tree canopy means at some point you'll be pruning it to a certain height. And that certain height will give you that length of timber. Yeah, remember, we don't need huge, great lengths of timber although that's nice even if it's just one and a half or two meters that's plenty and a lot of you will be pruning to that height anyway similarly on hedgerows or roadside trees often they're naturally pruned up to a certain height 
uh, by you, by someone else, by the passing bus, whatever it is. But what you're trying to get is that not free timber and also encourage a form of growth and reduce potential twists in grain angle. There's an awful lot that can be achieved by pruning better. And it's, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a strict and rigid task. I know plenty of people that go out for a walk in their woods or through their farm of an evening with the dogs and in a rather dramatic looking way take a pruning saw with them because it does look like you're going on some kind of hunt. But they will just go round and they will prune as and when they see branches that could do with coming off or they think uh, canopy could do with lifting a bit and they'll do it on a completely ad hoc basis without worrying too much about what time of year it is, how much they're taking off, how much canopy they're leaving. There is an awful lot of science into it, but some is better than nothing. And without doing it, just don't expect great results from your trees. So, the, 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 the final slide is, I suppose, a few things to bear in mind. Um, the first is, especially if we're talking about trees that are existing in your woodland, in a small woodland, in a hedgerow, in an agroforestry system, whilst they're sitting there growing, they're putting on biomass, there's no point in taking them down if you don't need to. If, if there's another reason for taking them down, then fair enough. If you don't need to, just keep them growing there. They're not doing any harm until you know what you're going to use them for. And that what you're going to use them for, for it might come down to a conversation between you, sawmiller, the local joiner, the local furniture maker, someone that's building a house. It's having these conversations beyond the forest gate, beyond the farm gate. And I think it's something people naturally do when they're diversifying their crops or their farm buildings. Um, they talk to people. It's, it's about demand. It's understanding what the demand is so you can supply the right product. And that's no different to any other product that you're growing. Know roughly where it's going to go and that'll give you a better chance of making money out of it. Um, and then once you do know you have trees coming down, once you know roughly what they're going to be for. They might be going into stock for you to sell on later at, say, a, a core set of thicknesses that you're going to saw it at. Even more so than traditional forestry, instructing contractors well is, is absolutely vital because people are so unused to taking down individual trees or lines of trees that are going to be sawn that it's like, some, it's like a craft that's been lost. And it's... It's very important, for instance, you can't afford to have 10% of trees shatter when they're felled because they could be your best oak. You know, they've got to be felled right. They've got to be sawn right. We've been onto so many sites where we've provided images like this for every single tree to the contractor and said, that, that red box, that, that's the length of log we need from this tree, right? And, that, that's what we want. And then you get there and they've sawn it in half. I said, well, you've still got the whole length, haven't you? It's just now in two parts. Said, yeah, but <laughs> it's not actually that useful anymore, is it? Go on, take it away for firewood, which is probably what they wanted to do with it in the first place. Um, but it's about stacking it as well, especially if it's going to be stacked on muddy, stony ground, or even on concrete, that it's on burrows, if you don't think it's going to be taken away quickly. It's about instructing the people that deliver the sawn timber back, if it's coming back, about where it's got to go, how it's going to be stored. It's got to have space, it's got to have air around it. You know, once these mistakes are made, then essentially what you end up with, no matter what your intentions, is just firewood. And you can lose what potentially is a very valuable crop of, say, burr oak that could be worth upwards of £1,000 a cubic metre as something that's worth £50 or £60 a cubic metre just from it being cut or processed wrong or that you haven't identified in advance what the potential of that piece of timber is. And then 
finally, while we've covered this, make sure it's accessible. You wouldn't harvest an agricultural crop and put it somewhere no one else can get at it. So why would you do that for timber? And so many places, it, it deserves the space of, the, of its value, if you like. You know, timber needs a fair amount of space to store it well. And especially if you're storing it for a while to season it, it needs space around it to get earth through it, to dry properly and cleanly, not be attacked by insects. And although these you know, this final slide is, might feel a bit nitpicky, the, these are critical factors that'll help you get from a standing tree to an actual valuable product. And this very final slide um, is just some of the products we've taken from um, the urban forestry work that we do. If people want to discuss the, uh, the, the, the ins and outs of supply chain, putting supply chains in place in more detail, or the economics of it, or the potential income streams, then the best thing to do is to give us a call and we can discuss it on a one-to-one -one basis. And I've got here um, some samples of timber that's come out of urban agroforestry systems because people always say, oh, that's all very well, but really, can you produce good, clean timber? Um, every single piece of timber here, uh, other than the piece of cross-laminated timber, has come from either urban or open-grown trees feel free to come and have a look and have a look through the species library here and uh, thank you very much and we'll take any questions are there any questions ah yes uh, yeah, you know, you're talking about sort of urban trees in urban areas, and obviously, if you're, you're cutting down trees in urban areas, you're going to get a lot of backlash from residents very often. Are there ways to kind of stop this? If you're using the wood locally, can you kind of encourage people to think of it as the trees a yeah. resource? Uh, I mean, it's that? not just urban areas. This happens in rural areas as well. People don't seem to people don't like trees being taken down, quite rightly. We have, in the business, quite a strong ethical stance on this. And when people approach us to do this kind of work, our first thing is to assess whether we think the trees need to come down properly so that we're clear in our own mind. And then sometimes we take quite a cowardly approach of saying, when you've taken the timber down, come and give us a call back and we'll come and do something with it for you. Um, but a lot of the time, so lend lease, for instance, is a good example because they are a multi-billion pound global development company. And the reason they got us in initially was because people were chaining themselves to trees at Elephant Park. Um, and they now bring us in on every project because they see the value in it and they can link to the community so well. So, Whilst I showed that picture of those red boxes and those green boxes, there's another set of timber that go from those trees that goes purely to community use, and every project has that. So it might go to schools. It might be some of the poorer sawn timber that goes to technology classes. It might go for um, uh, insect hotels, or it might go for habitat restoration on the site, or it might go to schools or community groups. But there's always a community benefit within that. And we we've not had any huge backlash yet when you start explaining the story. I would say also good, it's a good community stakeholder engagement also goes at the planting stage as well. Bring your, bring your neighbours, bring your community in to the, to the scheme you know, and explain the benefits because you'd be surprised a lot of people, if, if, if done properly and with best practice, you'd be surprised that people do see the benefit of trees, absolutely. Hi. Um, could you say a little bit more about drying the timber and that stage of it and uh, what processes you use there? Yeah, dark art. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we give it to someone else to do. So generally what we do is the timber will be sawn to those dimensions 
that take into account a certain amount of shrinkage, a certain amount of planing, um, and it will be uh, dried for as long as possible and then finished in the kiln. So it, it'll always go through the kilning process because modern houses are so, so dry. You just can't get down to the ambient moisture content you need. Um, we, without a lot of extra planning and a lot of extra work, the timber's going to have to sit in that humidity that it's going to end up in for quite a long time to season properly. And putting it through the kiln, as I know there's a, um, there's a very traditional view that kiln-dried timber isn't the same as air-dried timber. We just don't notice any difference whatsoever. And quite often we'll kiln dry straight from green. And it, other than the fact that it feels quite a energy intensive, arrogant, slightly arrogant process when you don't need to, if it needs to be done, we'll, we'll do that as well. But we always use um, people whose expertise is in kiln drying because it really, really is an art to do and every species will dry slightly differently and being able to look at the sawn timber and being able to pack it right is is important is that sort of facility something that is available in lots of parts of the country it sounds quite specialized yeah yeah southwest is well, quite special the, the, uh, some areas are better than others no. there's more in the southwest i think than other areas there's, there's a dramatic lack of kilning facilities in the whole country given how much kiln-dried timber is needed and that we use. Um, and that's in both softwood and hardwood dry. And, it, and it's concentrated on sort of two or three bigger sites. It feels quite precarious. Um, I'm going to show my ignorance here because I was going to ask maybe the same question, but I don't know if it's the same question because I don't know the difference between seasoning and drying, uh, okay, yes. or whether they're the same. And but so my question really was then, um, it, where and at what point do you season in relation to the cutting, and how long does that process mm. take? And and now, how does it relate to drying? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, sort of interchangeable, I guess. I suppose seasoning is quite often used in the context of air drying. So typically, what you do, you take the tree down, and then we saw it. And then we'd, leave, we'd stack it with gaps in it. It goes, has sticks through, what's called sticks through it to provide air to go through all the gaps. And it sits there in seasons. And there's a sort of loose convention of an inch a year to, to air dry material. And I think I'm not quite sure that's so true because so many timbers are so variable. Bu buying a 20 pound moisture meter from Axminster or wherever is, pays huge dividends in that but that's just letting it rest down and dry and then if you want you can put it into a mechanized kiln to just increase the rate of that process and the reason we saw it before seasoning is because there comes a point where you will just not drive out the moisture you know big oak beams probably never lose their or it probably takes decades to lose their internal moisture and other than cutting them in half to find out you won't know, <laughs> oh, which kind of negates the point of um, sort of have, having those big beams. So we're generally uh, drying these planks and killing the planks, but beam material, we're, it can sort of sit there for as long as you like, but you've got to have an appreciation that it's probably not going to dry in the middle for years and years. Mm, yeah. Hi. Is there any um, species that you found in the urban situation that are performing well, like in terms of form, that you might warrant, like growing out in an agroforestry system? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah. Um, I. Uh, there are so many factors to form in a tree: um, genetics, soils, competition, shading, light species um i i don't it's difficult i think you probably grow any species to fairly good form but that and i think genetics is probably one of the primary considerations so that orchard picture i showed that sweet chestnut is specific hybrids for fruiting yeah it, it was never grown to produce timber you, whether you could produce a hybrid that 
sort of gave you some better timber, but also fruiting. I don't know. It feels like a compromise in both ways. I think perhaps the better way of looking at it is not can you find species with good form, but the, the, I suppose there's two parts of this. One is looking at what is the timber on your farm or in your system or urban system at the moment and can you use it? There's nothing that's there, there's nothing you can do about that. Whatever its form is, whatever its species is, it's there. But if you are planting, then if timber is your primary concern, it's about buying hybrids that you know or are most like going to the nurseries that are most likely to provide you with trees that will produce good form. Not sure whether that fudges the answer or or not really. Um, and I, I should also, just uh, talking about seasoning before, if people want to know more about how this process works from this tree to a finished piece, there, there's plenty of places to look, but you know, Kelly's here, she'd tell us, the Woodland to Workshop course that Woodland Heritage runs is a three-day, much more detailed introduction to what I've just given you that would give you all the grounding you need to actually take a tree and actually produce timber rather than listening to me and Caroline blathering on for an hour. I don't know when, is there a spring course? Yes, keep an eye on the Woodland Heritage site. Yes. And that's Woodland Heritage. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hi. Hi, hello. So I come across quite a lot of beautiful big trees at work Client mm. for a reason yeah. or another, the tree needs to go. Mm. Solution one, firewood. Sometimes yeah. I see amazing timber and I say, we cannot do that, we need to plank it, right? Mm. And they're like, I don't want planks. So it's on my, and I say, okay, I'm gonna invest. And then the problem suddenly multiplies, as you know, is mm. how do you move these logs? How do you plank them? How do you take them to the kilter? So I keep on banging my head against the problem and I've been doing it and it seems to be a bit of a, um, economical societal, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm still looking for a DIY kiln portable that I can have on site or nearby. I don't want to take timbers to London to get kiln yeah, or yeah, to yeah. Baston timbers. It's all very far away, and that's what makes the cost go off the roof. They may as well buy French oak yeah. and plank their own oak. And this is what I keep on finding that the numbers don't work out for the clients. So, where is the first piece of tool? A part of the emotional value. They got the emotional value with that timber, but yeah. we, ca how can we get close to make it viable? Anything's to do with moving the timber and kill dry it within cost. So, don't know if yeah. that is a question. So, six, six or eight months ago, we had exactly the same conversation with um, Groner Britain and the National Trust, and the properties on the National Trust that were almost word for word, said what you said. Uh, how do we do, it's all very well saying you can do it, but how, how do we do it? So what we, we've been working with them and looking at how that's possible. And there's some properties within the National Trust that are already doing it. And they're using low cost portable mills generally, and um, none of them are kilning, but there are low cost kilning type operations that, people have used. So there used to be a guy called Tino Rawnsley in Cornwall that used solar kilning very effectively. Um, you could repurpose refrigerated containers. It's, they're not ideal solutions, I have to tell you, but, but they are a solution to do that. And, but the, the other way of looking at it might be to not do it on your own, which is where we're starting to look now. And actually, if if you've got a farm or a property or an estate or a town or whatever it is, you probably don't have enough timber in your agroforestry or open grown systems to, to warrant big capital investments. But as a hub of organisations, you potentially do. So if you and your neighbouring farms all have small amounts of timber, can you create a hub that allows you to create an economy of scale? And it's certainly a model that's been used successfully in the States. Admittedly, a small woodland in the States is about the same size as our biggest forest. But yeah, we, we feel that the technology is there to get around that problem now. And we're doing this is where this work with the National Trust is going at the moment to look at the potential of these hub models. So 
Well, the, the answer sadly is, if you can wait six months, there might be an, a better answer. If you keep an eye on our website, then there'll be updates. Evolvingforests.com. I mean, we have, we have a, a sort of a in, intellectual sort of knowledge gathered over the years. Jez and I used, this is what we used to do. We used to grant aid small businesses, albeit in Devon and Cornwall, to do exactly this, sort of invest in supply chains and how we vertic vertically integrate supply chains. It yeah. would, but yeah, so we have that, that you know, quite old now, but we have that experience and we're sort of updating that. That's what, that's what our next project will be. So. Yeah. But if you, if you want to discuss it, if you want to get in touch, we, I could talk to you endlessly about small-scale equipment <laughs> until you're so bored. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. So it's a really good presentation. Uh, Cheers. High-value timber in agroforestry is literally the headline of what I'm trying to achieve in my role with the Commission because there's a massive scope for it. Yep. Um, you're, it's really good to hear you recognise that in the southwest you are blessed with a really quite wide-ranging small-scale forestry mm. practices and, and skills and contractors and facilities. My question really is, what do you think we need across the whole of the country? And then the caveat is, how best to do it? Oh. To make everything that you've demonstrated here work. Innovative thinkers is one, I would say. Mm. Innovative thinkers. Um, I, yeah. Take a risk. I do, so, yeah. For those of you unfortunate, so yeah. For, for, for those of you unfortunate enough not to live in the southwest, <laughs> there's um, there, there's a very long tradition of quite innovative forestry and timber related work that started about a hundred years ago and has gone on. Um, through things like carpenter oak and a lot of timber processing innovations, work that Harriet has done in agroforestry. Um, also, you know, and, and there is that sort of entrepreneurship and innovation there. There's, in other parts of the country, I, the resources there mm. to do it. So if you look at the southeast, and it's all the sweet chestnut coffees, if you look at the north, every region has its own character. Quite, is it something around a culture of wood and entrepreneurship? I don't quite know how to how to put that into reality. You know, how to actually make that happen? I'm not sure because in the south, you know, the southwest, not some Nevada. It, it is certainly not perfect, and there's a way way to go. And potentially, there's you could also say well. You know, there is a lot that happens in the southwest, but actually having somewhere where you can just start from scratch. So, for instance, there's a whole new um, range of quite digitally advanced mobile mills coming onto the market. But obviously no one in the southwest has them because they all like to run the wood misers. And, but in an area where there isn't that, perhaps that's where the opportunity is to... Demonstrate uh, Southwest some of that. has had an awful lot of funding over the years, and I know there's some grant recipients in the room today, actually. But and it's, I mean Northwoods, Cumbria Woodlands, all of those projects that that have delivered that sort of small-scale kit funding. It's just how that how that is taken forward, and you know, I think we're now in a in a sort of a not I would say generational change is maybe a bit big, but we have we have farmers who really truly truly want to to look at forestry and producing timber and everything else that trees do. And I think it, it's bringing them with us because the, the skills that we actually know, the skills are transferable, absolutely. So it's how we, how we get them infused. There's one thing they do in the States that I would really like to see here, and that's revenue funding. So the lady that was asking about seasoning, could, could you fund people, not necessarily to have the capital kit, but that, though that would be useful, but to actually take timber and saw it and keep it a st and build up stock. Because one of the big problems with small scale enterprises is stock holding and having stock for, to meet demand. And revenue funding could really answer that by allowing people to build up a stock level or revenue loans. Which means that DEF have got to take a risk with funding. <gasps> <laughs> 
I can say that now. <laughs> uh, can I just add something to what, what you, mm. you said in the answer there? I'm Forrester over in uh, the east of England mm. um, on a private estate and with a, a small company yeah. that I, I work there. Um, and that's a lot of pine. So if you go over to East Anglia, it's pretty much all pine. That's, that's the site. But um, when I first went there, I looked about to find out what the outlets were uh, and where we could sell good quality hardwood into. And a lot of the stuff that you're talking about here up to um, uh, big, big volumes of, of good quality oak. And it's those niche markets. And it's knowing those markets are out there and finding those markets. So one of the things that we were able to do was set somebody up with a sawmill onto the estate so they could start to do that work. Mm. Yeah. This year I've had a bit of um, ripple sycamore. So again, looking for the markets yeah. that are out there, approaching people. Uh, and I think that's probably the way to, to start to kickstart it. So it's knowledge of what's out there, knowledge of your timber, and then, yeah, yeah. And then marketing you're it. You're right, yeah. Because it is quite specialist markets that you have to know. Yeah. But we've probably got time for one. Uh, OK, two, two more questions, and then I'm just going to sweat to death. Hi, uh, just sort of partly in response to these couple of supply chain questions, just there are some um, networks of foresters in the UK who have got machinery rings mm. sharing yep. uh, wood misers and saw milling machinery and it would probably be a useful thing for us in the Landworks Alliance to have a bit more information about how they've done it, where they got their money from, how it works, because mm. I think we can all see the potential for those to be repeated. But I mean, I know of two, and I'm sure there are more, where just people have shared buying the machinery and they rent, they pay a rental cost, they just book in when they want to use the, mm. when they want to use the sawmill, when they want to use the processing area, and they just pay enough to keep the system working. Their network of like eight, ten, ten different foresters, millers, farmers, you know, very easily repeatable. It's yeah. not, it's not rocket science there, but just seeing how some people have done it would be useful. And the other thing I just want to name check is um, a thing called Tree Station in Manchester, which is an urban. Um, uh, it's an urban tree station. They're, they're, they're a tree surgery based uh, thing. So their, their product all comes from some, some whole range of tree surgery operations, but they're doing everything there. Furniture grade timber, firewood, sawdust, yeah. chippings, biomass. Uh, some, a lot of their early income was based on firewood sales, mm -hmm. but now they're doing a whole range of things, drying their own timber. And they've got a cheap yard rented off the council, and they, as we know, timber uses up space, so the volume and how to pay for the space is an issue. But I think they're a really brilliant example of having uh, a business that is aiming to hit a lot of different out product outputs in a near to a consumer center and i think we could have those all around the country but they need funding they need yeah. like like you just said they need a bit of risk funding but actually there's a really yeah. good business model there that just needs a few more people yeah, to yeah. take their learnings yeah. and move on with it there, there is yeah uh, there's a couple in london as well yeah we take one more one more question <laughs> uh, just about you were saying that there's not there's a lack of uh, kiln facilities mm. um, but just thinking from an agroforestry perspective there's a you know, most arable farmers will have big drying sheds, grain sheds with drying floors um, across the whole country. And, you know, could you use those to dry timber? And have you done that? Uh, I haven't done that. I, could you do that? You, you, so they're, they're mainly floor drying, aren't they? Yeah. So you'd have to find a way of ducting that heat from the floor through a so you couldn't put the timber straight onto the floor. You'd have to have an insulated layer take that heat. It could, we've looked at ways of doing it from solar gain from roofs. And that's how the solar kilns work. You have solar gain within a roof space, and that's channeled down into the timber stack. And then um, there's quite a complex series of resting and heating the timber. Yeah, you could. I'm, I'm sure there will be, it'd be pretty innovative. But it'd be really interesting. Perhaps this is one for you know, DEFRA's new, you know, what we call the Cultural Productivity will be, innovation funding will be, rather than slurry, let's look at, sorry, let's look at um, drying timber instead. <laughs> Thank you very much for Thanks. staying and listening. Have a good show. Thank you for listening. We'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Sainsbury's, and our other major sponsors, Farmers Weekly Transition, Forestry Commission, and Till Hill, and all the attendees for making this show such an overwhelming success. To get advice and support for your agroforestry project, 
either visit woodlandtrust.org.uk forward slash plant or soilassociation.org forward slash agroforestry.